Thanks, Hannah. Welcome, everyone, to um, this evening's webinar, which is on swellings around the hand and wrist by uh, Mr. Zekri. <clears throat> the um, plan for this evening will be um, the lecture um, and then any invited questions. So if you can pop your questions in the chat, I'll try and keep an eye on them and I'll ask him at the end of his lecture. Um, when we've gone through the questions, depending on the time, um, we'll invite people to have some Viva practice. So probably two or three people, depending on how the time is. And we want to aim to finish around 8.30. The lecture and questions part of this will be recorded. So if you miss a part, don't worry about it. It'll be available on both the OR UK website and the Orthopaedic Academy website, um, probably in a few days for you to rewatch the lecture itself. <clears throat> When it comes to the virus, I know some of you are coming up to exams in April. Uh, the best practice is always to put yourself forward. Um, it's the best way to get rid of those nerves before the exam. And um, we've been where you are. We know how difficult it is, but it is the best way to learn. Um, <clears throat> you'll be sent some feedback questionnaires afterwards, and we do read those. So if you have any comments, please <clears throat> put them in the feedback. And we... Um, hope to improve in the future. So just a quick note about the intensive mock viva courses that are coming up. So unfortunately, these are later on in the year for the next diet of exams, um, but they're available on the ORUK website, which is oruk.org, and the Orthopaedic Academy website, which is orthopaedicacademy.com, I think, .co.uk, sorry. Um, <clears throat> so, um, Without any further ado, uh, Mr. Zekri is a hand and wrist consultant in Homerton Hospital. He's been trained internationally and I've worked with him a lot on some of these courses. He's very knowledgeable Thank and he you. has some very good questions for you. And I'm sure his lecture will be very useful. So um, I'll hand over to you, Mr. Zekri. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nikki. I'm Methat, one of the hand consultants. Uh, we'll start today. Uh, talking about the swellings around the wrist and hand. Uh, the aim of this talk, just to make it useful for you in the practice, uh, not only for the exam, because all of us, we see hand cases and it is important really to be aware of handling this kind of, of common problems. So starting with uh, the clinical evaluation of swelling, it's exactly like any other uh, swelling in the in the body, we take history, examine, and further investigations. So, with regard to the history taking, you must take a focused history, either in the clinic or in the exam. It is the same. I, I kept telling uh, my colleagues uh, preparing for exam, please consider the clinic is a test for you with every patient. Don't take a longer time. Don't just. And also you should be efficient. It doesn't mean that you, you uh, see the patient without picking up everything. You have to be very meticulous, but efficient. So the starting with the history, just take from the patient, what is the main complaint, the presenting complaint, then analyze it. If it is either pain, stiffness, swelling, any neurologic symptoms, then uh, if any trauma, the trauma has uh, a, a lengthy details. I have a slide of, of, of the history of the trauma. If, if we have time, we can share it. But I don't like to uh, give too much information and then and it will be lost. But it's important if you are dealing with the trauma setting. Then sometimes in, 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 in the clinic or in the exam, the patient might be misleading you. You tell, I have pain in my hand, yes. In the hand, because of the anatomy of the hand is unique, you have to be very precise. Ask the patient, please, can you point with one finger where is the pain? And instead of saying in the hand, and in the hand we have so many parts, so many pathology expected, okay? Then any associated symptoms uh, with the patient, especially if something like a neurologic problem, you should analyze all the neurology of, of the patient in terms of uh, paresthesia, numbness, uh, any, any other uh, cold intolerance, something like that gives you a clue about, about the condition you are dealing with. 
Again, mechanical symptoms. Is this important to know if there's any catching, any uh, uh, clicking? Is it painful clicking? Is it not painful? So you have to analyze all these symptoms uh, thoroughly. Uh, important to decide what options of treatment. You have to know the activity of daily living and hopes of the patient because this is important to decide what options of treatment you will offer the patient. Okay. Not, not every uh, patient will, each patient will have, uh, have to receive the same treatment. You have to tailor the treatment according to the patient's uh, activity, the living, job, uh, handedness. So you will gather all this information from the history, and then you will uh, proceed to the examination. I'm sure the history can give you clue of most of the pathology you uh, you expect to see. I prepared this slide. It's, it's good to summarize for you everything uh, you need to know about the history of, uh, sorry, of the examination of the swelling. <clears throat> if you see, uh, comment on 5S, site, size, shape, skin, scar, 3C, C's like color, contour, consistency, 3T's, tenderness, temperature, and transillumination. Imagine 11 item, you can talk in any even long case. You can talk uh, or uh, comment on 11 item. This will give you a lot of information to deliver to the examiner. <clears throat> then if you notice something else like any deformities, either in the nail and the finger, uh, any, anything surrounding the swelling, okay? Uh, relation or of the swelling to the tendon, nerve, artery, bone, and skin are crucial because we'll come to the next uh, few slides. You will see that the origin of these swellings arise either from soft tissue, bone, cartilage, or uh, any other structure. Again, as a swelling, is it uh, whatsoever the swelling, what is the impact of this swelling on the surrounding structures like neurovascular uh, structures? because you will see patient coming with lower lower nerve lower ulnar nerve uh, symptoms and you discover in the end that there's a ganglion okay uh, in the gains the canal pressing on the nerve and giving these symptoms so you have to analyze uh, all these items in the clinical examination once you've done the uh, history and examination uh, uh, of course, before we move to the investigations, all the hand pathology are disease specific. But in the beginning, you should bring the patient quickly to scan the hand and wrist, quick movement, check about any uh, pathology you can pick it up. So if it is a swelling, just focus on this swelling. You shouldn't talk nonsense about unnecessarily information because it, it's not like the other joints examination, for example, the knee joint, you have to give details about everything, collateral ligament, meniscus, uh, 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 cruciate ligaments. But in, in the hand, you cannot, it is, it is unlimited. So you, can, you cannot comment on everything. So once you talk the history, examine the patient, and then request the investigations. Normally we request, I normally uh, like the X-rays as a baseline you will be surprised to know that how much pathology you will pick up uh, by the initial X-ray uh, when you see the patient. So don't ignore the X-rays. Uh, don't have this type of thinking that the MRI scan is the best. MRI scan probably one of the list uh, investigations I request in the clinic, by the way. Uh, for example, if you have a scaphoid problem, it is CT scan is the best. If you have a ligament problem, probably the, the Arthroscopy is the best. So don't be uh, running after just MRI scan for everything. I'm still believing the X-rays are important. If you know how to interpret it properly and uh, correlate it with the clinical situation. So for example, uh, X-ray likes any swelling or any pathology in the bone, lytic lesion like this one, you have to comment on uh, number of the lesions uh, is it multiple in one finger or in other fingers in the other hand as well or not uh, location exactly is it metaphysial diaphysial or epiphysial 
a zone of transition is important. So as we, we know from the, the pathology of the tumors, you can easily say this is might be malignant or uh, uh, benign or mixed based on the X-ray only. Then ultrasound scan comes uh, as a real a real time examination of most of the uh, moving structures like tendons, joints. So we we use it a lot in in a hand, especially with the uh, swellings. Okay. <clears throat> when you see any swelling, you ask you, you, yourself this questions: What is this uh, swelling? What should be? What is the extent of this swelling? What I'm going to do for this swelling? What is the impact of the swelling on the function of the hand? And if you don't know the answer, yeah, what is this one? Just go for the diagnostic test. Uh, what is the extent? Examine the patient and request some imaging, and then you can do subsequently a staging of the swelling, if it is benign or, or malignant or normal uh, uh, swelling of the soft tissues. Then if you are in doubt about the decision, just go for NDT. All of us, we attend useful entities because we share the, the decision about difficult cases in our practice. And then in the end, impact on the hand function, you do hand assessment if the swelling is, is something uh, affecting the hand uh, dexterity. Okay, so any, any swelling in, in the hand and rest will arise from one of these structures. Is it bony, cartilage swelling, soft tissue? Is it benign, malignant, or intermediate? Okay, so this is are the origin of any tumor. So you have to think logically when you see uh, a swelling. Is it from a skin? Is it from the neurovascular bundle? Is it from the uh, tendons? Is it from the bone? Is it from the cartilage? And then ask yourself: Is it benign, malignant, or non-specific or uh, neurologic uh, swelling? Then you cat categorize it accordingly. So, namely, these are the tumors or uh, swellings which you can encounter in the hand and wrist. Uh, in the blue column, it's benign cartilage and bone. You can see the whole list. I will not go through this one. You can uh, easily uh, remember most of them. Even in the long bones like humerus, you can find the same pathology. In the other hand, uh, malignant bone and uh, cartilage tumors, again, among this list, I will just come and speak about the melanoma, by the way. I'm not going to talk about malignancy in the bones because this is beyond the scope of this uh, lecture. Then from soft tissue, we expect benign swellings like ganglion, lipoma, inclusion dermoid cyst, tenosynovial uh, giant cell tumor, glomus tumor, gout, synovial chondromatosis. And I believe these are the lists which you can expect in your exam. If you are focusing on for the exam purpose, which you should uh, these days, uh, these are the uh, commonest tumors you will you will get it. I had in my exam uh, ganglion, <clears throat> was I think from a chromoclavicular joint, something like that. So uh, be 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 ready for swelling in your exam because we have plenty, and they are the patient can be examined. If you, if you if you are examining the patient face to face, continuous uh, soft tissue tumors uh, could be vascular, could be neural uh, elements. Okay, so these are the categories of of the tumors or the swellings we are going to discuss uh, tonight. Uh, in details, in more details, will be the ganglion cyst, mucoid cyst, giant cell tumor of tendon sheath, glomus tumor, neural tumors, vascular, uh, bony tumors and uh, melanoma. So for sake of, it is just uh, attention to everyone. I will start with melanoma, despite you will never see uh, 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 melanoma in the exam, but this is important really to, for every, every one of us must know or at least suspect this is a, a melanoma, otherwise, the patient might have a catastrophic future. It is serious disease and easily missed because all of us, we deal with the trauma to the distal phalanx and you see subangle hematoma, but don't simply 
explain that this is subangular hematoma when you see a, a little uh, black discoloration of the nail bed. <clears throat> it is important to pick up this swelling. I think this picture, if someone, old patient came to your clinic and say, I knocked my finger maybe two, three weeks ago, and it's still getting black. I don't think the, you should think in, in melanoma in this one, uh, sorry, in, in hematoma in this one. You have to uh, su suspect melanoma. You have to escalate it to the specialist. As you can save this patient's life and uh, upper limb by early detection. As from this slide here, it, the prognosis of, of, of the melanoma is, is, is uh, depth related. And if you pick it up early, definitely this patient might get benefit from amputation or some sort of, tre of, of, of treatment. So uh, Breslow uh, classification thickness uh, less than 0.7 millimeter or less carries the excellent prognosis. That's what we would like to catch these tumors in this stage. Thicker than four millimeter, you can see the survival rate is the worst one you can imagine. There is another detailed classification, Clark, Clark's classification. It, it deals with the depth of uh, the melanoma and the distant metastasis if it is uh, metastasizing. And you, you can see that in the picture here, something a bit can be overlooked by anyone. So be, be careful, keep high degree of suspicion, please, when you see something like that. Sorry, I, I, I tried to give this slide. Maybe it is not important for exam, but important for in life. I will not go into the details about the, the uh, treatment of melanoma because it will not be, uh, I think, maybe important for the um, MCQ. Start the common uh, swellings. The ganglion is, is a common in practice, in exam, and in, in daily life is important. A uh, lot of patients coming referred by GP, referred by other colleagues because of a ganglion cyst, uh, because of recurrent ganglion cyst. They had surgery, they had aspiration, and you have to deal with this situation. So you should know everything about the ganglion. Uh, is it with a ganglion? I start with the, again history because um, I know where exactly the gangle, dorsal ganglion coming from. I X-ray the patient. I test for the scaphoid ligament and all the rest uh, intrinsic and extrinsic ligaments to make sure that I'm not missing the main pathology with this patient. Then it will be categorized either to be uh, idiopathic or some. Uh, or degen second to, to, to degenerative changes. The origin of the synovial uh, of, of the ganglion is modified synovial or mesenchymal cells at the synovial capsular interface. The outer wall of the ganglion is composed of multiple layers of collagen. The inner wall of the uh, ganglion has flattened fibroblast and mesenchymal cells. No synovial lining, so this is not a true cyst. And we know why it is on and off, why it is fluctuating in size, because it has one valve uh, allowing the synovial fluid to go outside the joint, but not returning back to the joint. <clears throat> it has this contents. I think all this information useful for the section one, if someone preparing for the uh, section one. Uh, the ganglion from the radiocarpal joint is different from the ganglion of the tendon sheath because tendon sheath one will be tiny and smaller in size than the, the, the dorsal wrist ganglion or volar wrist ganglion. But it's sometimes it's more symptomatic, by the way, when you have a tiny ganglion, you know, it is like the ureteric, ureteric stones. If you have a small ure, ureteric stone, it's so painful not like the staghorn stone, which you can incidentally discover it in the kidney. Sometimes it is not symptomatic. So the same with the, with the uh, tendon sheath, uh, tendon uh, ganglion, because it can cause a lot of mechanical problems. These are the theory behind it. Uh, again, the origin of the dorsal uh, wrist ganglion from the scaphoid ligament most of the time. Uh, volar ganglion could be from many other sources, 
commonly STT joint, the volar ulnar side ganglion usually arises from the distal radio ulnar joint close to the TFC and bisotrichetral uh, joint. Volar ganglion recurrence is high always after excision. I normally take plain X rays even if it is normal, uh, at least not to miss any anything uh, possible with the uh, carbon instability. Then Ultrasound scan if the patient is willing for aspiration and uh, non-operative treatment. Or MRI scan, I do MRI scan when I am planning for, for, for surgery. You see in this example here on the left, uh, left side here, the MRI scan uh, showing, you see the stock, a narrow stock coming from the dorsum of the capsule here of the wrist. And if you follow it up from the serial cuts of the MRI scan, you will find it's coming from the scaphoid ligament. Uh, when it comes to management, don't rush and offer surgery because you have to be safe to do the surgery. You have to make sure that you the, 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 the ganglion is not going to recur again. It's safer to start at least with simple measures like aspiration. Sometimes the, the ganglion disappears by itself in 50% in of the population. Sometimes it goes by itself. I, I saw uh, recently a couple of patients because they have been waiting for, uh, uh, for the operation and they booked an a, a, a point in the appointment in the clinic and they told me the ganglion is gone. So we canceled the, the uh, operation because it can disappear by itself. Nowadays, we do it arthroscopically because the idea to just to take the stock of the ganglion with one centimeter of the capsule. So just two portals and one from uh, one, two, portal and one from three, four or six R, then you address the dorsal capsule, take the stock till you see the tendon of extensive carby radialis and that's it, finished. You will find the ganglion itself evacuated inside the joint and it rarely, rarely it recurs again. If you are going to do excision, open excision, you should do transverse incision, please, not vertical. And uh, you have to excise again one centimeter from the capsule. Don't close it. It's you have to take it out with the stock. And here, this is a, a, a recurrence rate in the arthroscopic versus the open. Uh, it's so minimal uh, in, in the arthroscopic uh, excision. Mucus cyst is the, the, another version version of the. Uh, ganglion cyst, but it, it affects the interpharyngeal joints, the distal interpharyngeal joints. It is this is uh, another uh, version of the of the ganglion, and the intrinsic thing is that the mucus cyst usually appears in conjunction with early degenerative changes, but not with the advanced severe arthritic changes. I see a lot of patients coming uh, candidate for fusion of the DIPJ with deformity, with no joints at all, they never get uh, ganglion cyst, sorry, uh, mucus, mucus cyst. But you can find it easily in a uh, younger patient with suddenly uh, changed arthritic changes. And uh, clinically, uh, it is it is has, has been always uh, misdiagnosed by the GPs or other uh, colleagues, sometimes they think this could be a malignancy, it could be something, uh, uh, dermatology. Uh, rarely someone think about the uh, gang, uh, mucus cyst. As you see, the impact of the, the mass here, as it is pressing on the uh, germinal matrix, it can lead to uh, ridging of the nail. In the x-ray, you can see the, the osteoph osteophytes and the uh, arthritic changes. Okay, treatment. This one needs again non-operative treatment is not successful most of the time. However, surgical treatment is important due to uh, infection. It's quietly common infected, quite quite common uh, open sinus to the joint. So we don't like to to have such 
serious complication, it is better to be excised easily under local anesthetic. These are the, uh, when you see a, a, a mucoid cyst, the most important how to design, how to design your incision. It's not only to make a longitudinal cut or edge cut or Y cut, uh, y, y incision. It's so important because the skin is not mobile in this area. And if you uh, make a mistake and uh, you lead to deficiency of the soft tissue coverage, the joint will be exposed and this will be a big problem for the patient. So you have to think what is your plan, how to excite, how to plan for the incision. This is the most important. Uh, normally, whatsoever the incision you are familiar with, the idea you have to take the stock again, similar to the main ganglion. It will be lying between the collateral ligament and the extensor tendon. So you should, shouldn't injure any of these two structures, but you should excise uh, a, an ellipse of tissue of the capsule with the cyst between the ligament and collateral ligament and the terminal extensor tendon. Coming to one of the other swellings, uh, this is one of the patients I excited. You can see how big is the swelling and uh, the, from the thumb. I asked him, why did you, you didn't come early? He said, because of COVID and I couldn't really uh, come during COVID. So it, it, it's growing to this massive uh, size, a giant cell tumor uh, or nodular tenosynovitis. You, you should know the, the other names. Uh, it is arising from the tendon sheath. You should differentiate it from the giant cell tumor of the bone. This is a completely different entity. It's second most common soft tissue tumor. You see it in the in the hand clinic after the ganglion, commonly uh, near proximal and distal interphalangeal joint. Histocyte-like cells and multinucleated giant cells. These are the components of the giant cell tumor. No association uh, of trauma fracture or any other uh, scenarios. A strong association between uh, rheumatoid arthritis and giant cell tumor. Rarely, it is locally aggressive. Uh, recurrence rate, again, is a bit high, 10 to 32%. Uh, the treatment will be marginal excision. With, with, with such huge swellings like that, it is not only to make a, a cut, you have to plan the cut. You have to excise also the redundant skin because if you if you look in the finger here, if you take it, chill out the, the swelling, you will live by a big redundant skin, which you should plan again how to excise the extra skin. The same with the thumb. It was uh, important to plan when I planned to excise this one, how to avoid the neurovascular bundle, how to uh, avoid the area of sensation in the thumb because the thumb is important part of the hand. <clears throat> uh, next swelling will be the lipoma. It's quite common to see it in, in hand clinic. It is benign tumor of uh, mature, mature adipose, uh, adipocytes. It can be subcutaneous, intramuscular, intra, uh, extramuscular, or intraosseous sometimes when you, you, you do an uh, MRI scan or CT. It is painless, mobile, and stable mass, as you see from this old lady uh, picture. The diagnosis is made by MRI scan, with the MRI scan studies, uh, just especially with this uh, age group, if, or if you have any suspicion about rapid growth of the tumor or the swelling, you should be careful. It's quite rare to have lipo aggressive lipoma in the hand, but we know the lipoma in the back is, is, is serious, but in the hand, most of them they are causing only either cosmetic problem or pressure symptoms. Uh, treatment, if, if, if you see the patient needs uh, surgery, you need intervention or excision, you can excise it uh, just margin surgical resection if it is causing troubles. We do this kind of operations under local anesthesia, by the way, uh, wide awake local anesthesia. So this, this is not a big, you don't need to anesthetize fully. And this for more details, if you would like to uh, get more details about the histology and the, the types of uh, lipoma, if you have any questions in the MCQ. 
going to uh, another kinds of tumor, be careful. When you do a common operation like carpal tunnel syndrome, uh, when you do decompression for the carpal tunnel, if you see the nerve looks doesn't look as normal as you you expect, please don't do anything to the nerve. Close the, take some photos, send it to the local peripheral nerve injury unit, and close the wound. Don't do anything else. Uh, they will investigate it further. If you have any clinical suspicion of of a report of MRI scan or ultrasound scan based on your assessment, trust your assessment and the patient's complaint more than uh, anything else. Because I have seen a lot of reports contradicting each other. Someone says ganglion, other says schwannoma. And in the end of the day, if you open this one up and you find it nerve tumor, the patient and you will be in troubles. You have to be very careful before opening to take any swelling. Make sure that you are confident this is not a nerve injury. So for schwannoma and uh, neuroloma, they are common, by the way, in the hand in, in, in our practice. They are benign, yes, benign tumors, but we cannot deal with it because they need a microscopic uh, uh, surgical microscopy, which is uh, not available everywhere, and it's better to be handled by the peripheral uh, nerve uh, injury unit. Male to female, one to one, solitary or multiple, and exactly it is um, mimicking a ganglion or lipoma. Most of uh, same patient you have ultrasound scan says this is ganglion, MRI scan says uh, uh, neuroma or schwannoma. At the end of the day, if you are in doubt, don't touch this kind of patients. And by the way, the, the most important, the symptoms and the examination of the patient, because it will be giving a neurologic type of pain, not routine dull pain of, of, of ganglion or um, lipoma. Schwannomatosis, schwannomatosis, which is, uh, is similar to uh, neurofibromatosis type 2, uh, they are both characterized by growth of schwannomas, but in the former lesions are late onset and may cause severe pain. MRI scan, again, it is just up to 80% accuracy uh, to differentiate from between uh, neurofibromatosis type 2 and schwannoma. Uh, treatment options, again, we, we refer these patients to the specialist, but generally either to observe or inoculation of the tumor from within the nerve. Uh, neurologic swellings, we have vascular swelling. One of them is a, a hypothenar Hummer syndrome. You can see this is a, an uh, angiogram showing a neurism of the ulnar artery. And uh, it can be mistaken again as swelling. And you open this uh, swelling up and you'll, you'll be again in trouble. So will be given from the history. You'll find the manual worker with repetitive microtrauma at the level of Gaines canal uh, as it passes over the hamate bone, leading to the vessel, vessel irregularity, aneurysm formation, or thrombosis. Aneurysm can cause compression of the sensory nerve uh, uh, branch of ulnar nerve, intrinsic muscles, and numbness of the ring and less, uh, small fingers, a tender mass in the hypothenar eminence, pain in the palm, numbness, plus minus ischemia of the fourth and fifth digits. It depends on where exactly the swelling in relation to the zone of the ulnar, ner ulnar nerve in Gaines Canal. Is it zone one, two, or three? Differential diagnosis of uh, hypothenar Hammer syndrome will be benign tumors in the hand as we mentioned before, lipomas, schwannomas, vascular, any other uh, swelling must be kept in mind as giving a similar picture exactly like this one. Again, this one should be dealt by vascular surgeon or, micro, or plastic surgeon uh, who is dealing with microvascular uh, surgery. Uh, Berger's disease is, is one of the differential diagnoses which can present as irregularity. It has a corkscrew appearance on the MRI scan arthrogram of the hand 
and can mimic uh, this syndrome. However, involvement of the digital arteries in the former while involvement around the wrist joint in the Hummer, uh, hypothenar Hummer syndrome will differentiate uh, between them. Uh, MRI scan and MRI scan arthrogram can conclusively diagnose the syndrome by uh, depicting aneurysm formation and pathognomonic corkscrew appearance. A vascular tumor, this might be seen in, in, in pediatric settings uh, as uh, the child will be born with something like that. Uh, and the differentiation between hemangioma and vascular malformation is important because both of them have different pathology, different uh, course of the disease. Hemangioma are characterized by uh, variable spontaneous involution over time. Maybe this in this picture of the child may be hemangioma or vascular malformation. Diagnosing the lesion based on the history and examination. Uh, treatment of hemangioma versus mal malformation is very different. Hemangioma will increase in size in the first years of life, but will involute or shrink by age uh, of seven. A vascular, uh, a vascular malformation is uh, present at birth and grows proportionally with the child. Uh, continued with a vascular malformation, it will be associated with, as I think we know in other sites of the body, the, the impact on the general circulation of, of, of the patient. Uh, pulsatility might, might be, may be observed with the brewery and larger lesions may cause steel phenomena. I think this could be in, 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 in uh, bigger lesions, something like the shunt of uh, the dialysis. These cases should be, I think, will be dealt by vascular. It's not, it is, but it's important to know the, the list of your differential diagnosis. Uh, commonly, we encounter the glomus tumor. Sometimes it's difficult to diagnose it. It's not easy. But from the history, again, it, is, it, is, it can give you some clue about the condition. So vascular tumors, tumor of glomus uh, bodies, uh, it, it happens in sub angle region in the fingers and the deep dermal area of the palm and wrist. Again, it is not only in, under the nail, it can be happening elsewhere in the hand and wrist. <clears throat> Glomus body is a perivascular uh, temperature regulator and it could be solitary or multiple. This is the age group in the second, third and fourth decade. Diagnosis, exactly disproportionate pain compared to the size of the small tumor, even sometimes you don't see the tumor in the early stages, by the way, but you, 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 the patient describes exactly tenderness, neuro, neurologic uh, pain, and cold uh, sensitivity. Uh, you will be lucky if you see a bluish nodule under the nail with, again, pressure symptoms on the nail leading to ridging of the nail. MRI scan is diagnostic. Uh, you will not find any uh, abnormality with the X-rays or ultrasound scan. Uh, the MRI scan is diagnostic for this condition. A low signal intensity on T1-weighted scans and high signal intensity of T2-weighted uh, scans. Histologically, it's composed of glomus cells, vascular channels lined by endothelial cells, and smooth muscle cells. The trouble when you open to take this swelling out, it is not easy to pick it up. It's not easy to find it. Uh, sometimes you open and you can't find what you are expecting from the MRI scan. So be careful. You might open and close without taking it out. The recurrence rate is high. <clears throat> okay, differential diagnosis will be leiomyoma li or hemangiomas uh, can also present with the pain. Moving to uh, bony swellings, this always mistaken as uh, a dislocated carbometacarbal joints. Most of the patients, they have pain. They can give history of, of a fall on outstretched hand at some, at some point. But it is, uh, if you know the anatomy, if you know the story, uh, probably you will be easy to, uh, or confidently to confirm this is not a fracture dislocation or subluxation, it's a metacarbal boss. So the os styloidoitum, the styloidoitum, 
is an accessory carbon bone located between the trapezoid, capitate, and second and third metacarpal basis. Uh, in women, two times more frequently than in men. Uh, just seen a lady uh, day before yesterday. The third or fourth decades, exactly. This is typical, by the way. The same lady was the same age. I see it frequently in the clinic. The result of uh, appointment between the capitate and uh, the base of third metacarpal uh, of the trapezoid and the base of the second metacarpal uh, bone during the wrist extension causing uh, the pain. This is a nice, a nice paper. If you can uh, quote it, it shows uh, the map of accessory bones because you should be confident as orthopedic surgeon to say this is not a fracture, either accessory styloid process, accessory uh, trapezium. You can see here about 25 or uh, more type of uh, 19 type of, of accessory bones. It's important to know this map, at least to uh, say this is not a fracture. Again, we'll not uh, spend much time, but the most important here, a CT scan can, can differentiate, of course, between the acute or, or, or uh, fracture or coronal fracture or uh, metacarpal boss. The treatment, again, don't rush and offer treatment for these patients because you might lead to uh, carbal, carbal metacarpal instability. So you have to be careful. Exhaust all the non-operative treatment, splintage, uh, steroid injection, and again, uh, excision, be careful because you might overexcise the, the, the joint and this will lead to uh, instability. Steodistioma, this is, uh, again, this is a picture from uh, one of the centers reported uh, 25 uh, uh, patients and these are the location of the steodistioma. It will be very subtle in the x-rays, but again, the, the history is typical of like uh, any steodistioma. Uh, 12 of all benign tumors, see how much is common. Uh, children and young adults, uh, less than 40. Uh, it is self-limited, but I saw most of the patients they are really suffering severe pain. Most of them, they have been mistaken as uh, a fracture because there is a history of trauma, which is just uh, draw the attention to the problem. Uh, it produces intense signs and symptoms because of the prostaglandin secretion by the tumor cells. And that's why we, when we give non steroidal it gives some relief. Uh, to be honest, in, in, in the cases I have seen and I treated, I give them the same, uh, either aspirin or uh, stronger non steroidal It didn't make any difference. Probably because of the inflammation and the changes in the finger, as you see from this 19-year-old uh, uh, university student, it, it was, it was, uh, severely inflamed and uh, it is symptomatic and it causes really uh, terrible pain for the patient. Uh, normally we, we, we exercise uh, uh, advice excision. We, don't, we cannot wait years for the self-limiting uh, uh, nature of this swelling. And as you see from the X-ray on the right, right hand side, there's a little nidus uh, by the way, MRI scan is useless for the for the steodistioma. It is just a CT scan, and uh, intraoperatively sometimes it's difficult to find this tiny, tiny as if it is a, about uh, maybe less than one millimeter. Other uh, hard tumor, it is enchondroma. We see it uh, most of the uh, most of the time in fracture clinic after minor trauma, they present with some fractures. You take X-ray, you, you find lytic lesion like this one, uh, benign hyaline cartilage tumor that are thought to be derived, de derived from uh, adjacent growth plate, the, the physial or metaphysial, uh, it is quite common in hands. Uh, 20 to 50 uh, uh, asymptomatic year old asymptomatic lesion discovered incidentally on a graph. And these are the description of the x-rays. <clears throat> Treatment, most of the time we observe if the position is acceptable, if the symptoms are less 
uh, operative if if there's m, m, m embedding fracture uh, close to the base of the uh, bone or intraarticular about to invade the joint you should interfere before damaging the joint uh, chondro sarcoma this is an aggressive form of uh, malignant form and this one should be uh, referred to local tumor unit not to touch these patients either biopsy or any treatment this this slide will give you quick uh, differential diagnosis between four common tumors encountered encountered in the wrist and and hand a giant cell tumor and chondroma you see the characteristics are different uh, osteogenic sarcoma and aneurysmal bone cyst I just kept it for mobilization. Uh, finally, there are two systemic uh, uh, multiple enchondromatosis, serious, two serious disease diseases, uh, and they are inherited, inherited diseases. Uh, the first one, Olier's disease, is important. I think this is this in, 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 in multiple choice questions. Uh, skeletal dysplasia type with failure of normal enchondral ossification. And chondromas uh, throw, throw out the metaphysis and diaphysis of long uh, bones. Involvement of bones are this involved with bones are dysplastic with shortening and uh, bowing. Risk of malignancy transformation is less than 30% compared to Mafushi uh, disease, which is nearly 100%. Uh, with Mafushi, you can see in the x ray here, there's some calcification and due to vascular uh, involvement or calcific flip bikes. Okay, uh, I think uh, I, I tried to be quick to, to cover uh, most of the topic. And now if you see something like that, you have to know how to diagnose it. And thank you very much. Happy to uh, receive any questions. Thanks a lot, Meta. <clears throat> I found it really interesting. I um. <laughs> I had I was doing the overnight fracture clinic today and I had a prisoner brought in with a carpal boss and then his prison officer showed me his Jupitron's contracture as well. So, you know, even though I don't work in a hand unit, some of these things are still quite relevant. Um, I can only see one question from um, Jabez, who asked at the beginning, why do we do a transverse incision for ganglion excision? Yeah, because it is uh, uh, it is with Langer's lines so the scar formation will be less and uh, you don't need a longitudinal one because uh, we reserve the longitudinal even I don't do longitudinal per se I do like lazy s uh, cosmetically to avoid the keloid and scar formation so the healing will be much better with the transverse one the same by the way when you do the curvan um, uh, tenus and vice the curvan first com dorsal wrist compartment uh, you see the hand surgeon incision different from the non-hand surgeon because we, we do transverse incision or a chevron incision rather than longitudinal incision. Okay, great. Thank you. 